Welcome back, everybody. We are sampling today, and I'm here at the pier. Um, underneath this pier runs our discharge line all the way about 500 feet off the edge of that pier. So I go out uh, twice a year and take samples for dilutions uh, for our acute and chronic toxicity tests. I'm going to explain those um, a little later, but uh, it's one of the more fun parts of the job. There's the beachfront there, uh, the cool town I get to work in. And um, yeah, so uh, one of the perks actually um, is coming out and doing a beach check every week um, for our discharge permit. And that's going to kind of uh, dovetail into what we're actually talking about this episode, aside from sampling, is regulations. We're going to talk about um, NPDES permits. We're going to talk about um, all the rules we have to play by um, and some of the laws you need to know about for your wastewater treatment plant operator exam. So uh, the rest of this video will be a little bit less picturesque, but let's head back to the plant. Um, after I'm not going to film getting my samples. It's, it's pretty dicey on this pier. It's closed to the public for safety reasons, so I really want my wits about me while I'm out there sampling. Um, so I won't film that, but uh, this is just grabbing some dilution water for it. Um, those tests, like I said. So let's head back to the plant and talk about uh, the rest of the annuals. So I'm filling out my chains of custody and I noticed something. Um, this is why it's always good to double check your uh, bottle count. <clears throat> See on here, I've got 22 bottles effluent 24 hour composite and two for ocean water dilutions. Um, and just so you know, here's all the things we're testing for. We've got ammonia, we've got cyanide, uh, chromium. There's all sorts of volatile stuff in here. Um, this report is so long. Um, there's gross alpha and beta. We're doing um, a acute and chronic toxicity. That's what this ocean water is for. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that um, on the whiteboard. But uh, yeah, it's always good to make sure that your bottles jive. So this is last year's chain. Nothing should have changed, but um, it did. They sent me these new containers um, called cube tainers. If I can show you. That's what it looks like. They are one gallon poly unpreserved containers. Well, I'm normally used to having half gallon poly unpreserved. And um, so you'll see two right there. Uh, we had to change that to one. If this had gotten a sample receiving and I used this chain of custody, they would have they would have not kicked it back, but there would have been confusion and questions. So I actually called the lab and said, hey, um, is you know, let's do a bottle count. And actually, we ended up with 17 bottles uh, for our effluent 24 hour composite after all, all was said and done. Communication with the lab is very important, especially with third party labs. Um, I really lean on their expertise for um, what bottles we actually need. So now let's um, let's talk about some of these bottles. Uh, this is in addition to what we talked about in the uh, sampling video that's already up on the channel and I'll link to that at the end of the channel. And uh, let's let's talk about a couple other bottles real quick. These are some different bottles. Some of them are the same from what you saw in the in the first sample video. Um, some are different. So this is a poly, another version of a poly unpreserved. This is that cube tainer I just told you about. It actually um, pops out and it makes a, a cube as its name describes. Um, we've got an amber glass with hydrochloric acid in it. We've got a VOA vial, volatile organic um, analysis, is what VOA stands for. That's hydrochloric. That's the zero headspace sample. I don't think this one's got a preservative. Um, but these also come um, in ambers, uh, which just depends on what the test is. Um, this is an oddball. This has got sodium hydroxide in it. You normally have acidification. Um, I'm actually not sure what this one's for. This is one of those situations where I kind of lean on the lab. Um, or I'll have to call them and ask them what that analysis is. So I label my bottles, right? Um, we've got, this is my ammonia test. Um, this is going to be a grab and it's got sulfuric acid in it. Uh, you see a hex buffer that's for chromium. Um, this is nitric acid. I'm going to bet that's metals. That's pretty typical. And notice my custody seals are all in place. Um, this is, uh, these are just more bottles that you're going to run into. Um, and like I said in the initial video, why I said the sodium hydroxide was odd is most of the t that's a base. Most of the time you're acidifying um, your sample to fix your sample. But there's all sorts of stuff we test for. Um, like I, you've already seen on the chain, we're testing for a ton of stuff. This report when it's done is like 40 pages long. Just wanted to give you an idea of more bottles you might run into. I have seen uh, poly unpreserved bottles wrapped in tin foil, like aluminum foil. Um, it just really depends on what you're doing. And so just because these are certain bottles that are um, in front of me doesn't mean that that's all the bottles you'll ever run into. Uh, talk to your lab folks and, and see if there's other uh, bottles that you might be running into in your um, lab. So I'm going to be, um, the, the next thing we're going to do is fill one of these boas. I mean, I'm going to do the one with the hydrochloric acid in it to show you, um, you know, how you're going to do this without displacing the preservative. And um, uh, the thing you want to look for is that there's a meniscus and uh, meniscus normally kind of does this little loop thing. If you look at a graduated cylinder, you'll see it kind of do like a half circle kind of coming down. This one does a, a reverse meniscus, and I'll show that to you in the video when we do it. 
Um, that's how you know you've got no air. It's a zero headspace sample, no air. And um, you can even see there's these like areas on here. You can look in the sight glass there or underneath and you'll see air bubbles if there's air bubbles in it. And if they see air bubbles at the lab, they should be throwing these out. Okay, so let's fill these bottles up and uh, move on to that. Okay, here we are actually a week later to do this. Um, uh, some of you might hear I got a little bit of a raspy voice. I got a cold. Uh, so sorry about that um, sound quality. But the other thing is, is when I was doing my annual samples, I just needed to get them done. I was kind of under the gun and that's not a great time to be shooting videos uh, for this channel. Um, but uh, I'm going to demonstrate this to you now. This is a VOA. Oh, and by the way, those of you who are a little bit more keen eyed and, and watch a lot of my content, you'll see that I've actually edited this into a short. Uh, for those of those out there who aren't subscribers that this could help. Um, so uh, it, what you're about to see, if you saw that short, uh, you can just fast forward to the whiteboard segment um, because this is just a regurgitation of that. Um, anyway, um, this is a VOA vial. VOA stands for Volatile Organic Analysis, okay? Um, and there's two objectives when you fill one of these. One is zero headspace, meaning no air bubbles at all. You're gonna have a reverse meniscus on the top when you place the cap on it. Um, and the purpose of that is to make sure that the stuff you're testing for doesn't volatize or disperse into the air. Um, you want it all in the water because you're testing for volatile stuff. So um, that's game number one. Game number two is you'll see there's a preservative in here. This one's hydrochloric acid. We're gonna make sure that it um, doesn't displace. Okay, so we're gonna carefully pour it in here. Um, when you're doing this from a sample tap, like in a water system, it's a lot easier than when you're doing it as a, uh, like a wastewater sample, okay, from a composite sampler. So I've taken my mixed composite sampler, I've gotten a sterile brand new bottle from my bottle stock um, so that there's no cross contamination. And I poured my mixed composite into here and I'm gonna use this to pour into here, okay? Um, so, and there's a lot of different other preservatives that can come in these, uh, not, it's not just acid. You could have dechlorinating agents and things like that. So my first step is to pour it to the shoulder carefully, um, just so long as I don't overflow the bottle. As high up as I feel comfortable. Okay, so there's that. See how high that is? And now I'm going to do the zero headspace part of the sample. So I'm gonna fill the cap full of sample and I'm going to pour it right there. You can see we're getting close. All right, there's my reverse meniscus. You see how it's poking out the top? When I place this cap on top, it'll smash it and a little bit of that water will come off the side. That's okay, that's okay. What you don't want is to be like overflowing the whole, the whole container, okay? So I'm gonna place that cap on there, screw it down, and that's gonna push out that water there. And I can see from this vantage point that there's no air bubble. You can't really see because the air bubble would be floating to the top, but I can see there's no air bubble, no air bubble. And another way to check is to tap it, tap it. Just shake it up a little bit, to make sure that no air bubbles are stuck to the, like on the side of the glass that I can't see with the label and the, they should float to the top and I see no air bubble. The lab will throw these out if there's air bubbles in them, okay? Um, and uh, that is especially important when you're doing drinking water samples that are entrained with air. I have done a lot of those and they are a pain. But um, if you can just remember to do your best to get the, the air bubbles to the top, open the lid back up and then top your sample back off and you should be good. Okay, so that's how you do a VOA sample. Um, the next thing that we're going to do is go to the whiteboard and we're going to talk about some regulations and uh, talk a little bit more about some of these samples we took today. Let's go. Okay, welcome back to the whiteboard, everybody. We are talking about regulations up here and a little bit more of toxicity sampling down here. Um, and that's gonna wrap up this video. Uh, but before we jump in, if you're getting anything out of this uh, video, please like, subscribe, uh, pass to your friends and let's help folks get certified. Um, a couple quick notes about regulations and regulators before we start um, taking off this list. Uh, the first is, uh, I'm gonna make an analogy. Um, this is not, I'm not saying that wastewater is a game, but if you envision wastewater treatment like a game, like football or basketball or something. Um, the regulations are the rule book, the permits are the rules you play by, and the regulator is the referee, right? The referee will call foul, they will tell you you're doing the right thing. They're actually there to guide and help make sure the game is played correctly, okay? Um, they are not, let me tell you what a regulator is not there to do. They're not there to wait in the bushes for you to make a slight mistake and then jump out of the bushes and bust your chops. That is not what a regulator does. Um, I have met some paranoid operators in my time um, and I'll say this, I try to keep it light on the channel. I'm gonna say this right now. The very worst thing you could ever do is lie um, about a problem you're having in your plant to a regulator or falsify a, re a record because uh, you don't wanna get in trouble. Uh, that is the best way to get in trouble <laughs> is to falsify records 
and to lie. So I'm not trying to be all like, you know, super serious here, but I, something you can absolutely do in this industry is make a mistake and be open and upfront about it. And the regulators will help you. They are engineers after all. Okay. They are trained to in process and they're trained to help. So um, they will help you. Uh, and also if you're having violation issues, oftentimes that actually opens you up to funding. It's not like, um, you know, they're just going to like, you know, pour a bucket of, you know, poo on you and, and laugh at you. It, they're actually going to help you write grants and get you some, some help um, in fixing your problems. Okay. So I'm going to get off the whole regulator thing. I just think that some operators do look at them skeptically. And in my experience, they've always been pretty helpful. Okay. Um, and as I go through these things, these are mostly things I've, that you, that I have seen on my exams or, um, deal with in a day to day, um, in my day to day world. Uh, if you are watching this video and you think I missed something, please put it in the comments below, um, to help people, um, study. Okay. The first thing we're going to talk about is the national pollutant discharge elimination system NPDES. You might need be asked, um, for this definition. Notice it's pollutant, not pollution. That's a common mistake. National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. This was, I'm going to kind of jump around here. This was set <clears throat> into motion by um, US EPA and the Clean Water Act. Okay. Um, this is a national, nationally regulated system. Okay. And this is mostly going into receiving waters. Um, there's something I didn't write on here called the waters of the US. There's a lot of controversy and litigation around that. I doubt you're going to be asked about it. But in essence, it defines what is under an NPDES permit. And Mostly it's going to be navigable waterways, interstate waterways, um, oceans, you know, things like that. Things that are under the federal jurisdiction that a state doesn't have absolute control over. But again, that's kind of, that's kind of strange because, you know, feds have tried to get a little bit more reach on that. So um, that is the first type of permit you might have is an NPDES permit. I run under an NPDES permit. I discharge to the Pacific Ocean. Okay. Other discharge permits are state level. Um, they're going to be in California. It's a WDR, a waste discharge requirement. I know in New York, you guys have a SPDES, the state pollutant discharge elimination system. There's way, other wastewater discharge permits. Um, I can't help you with the permit that's in your state. You need to look that up. I can only tell you about what's in California because that's the world I live in. Okay. Um, and even though the NPDES is federally run, the authority is handed down from the EPA to the state agencies. The regulator I deal with is the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Okay, it's California State. Um, I do not deal with the US EPA, right? Um, and so, yeah, these, the state is typically going to be overseeing you and they're going to be enforcing federal and state laws. Um, and these discharge, other discharge permits, by the way, is going to be like ground discharge, all right? Um, like leach fields, spray fields, uh, um, things like that. US EPA sets the federal standards and the states have to meet or be better than them. Um, so what that means is uh, like my discharge permit is a 40 BOD, 40 TSS effluent. That's very generous. Um, I'm always under 10, but it's really nice to have a lot of runway in case there's this, you know, um, process control issue I'm having. Um, but if the state came in and said, yeah, 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 I know EPA says 40, but we're saying 20. That's well within their jurisdiction. They're allowed to do that. Um, and that's all within reason, you know, um, but they have to be better. The state can't come in and say, I know the Fed said 40, but we're going to let you do 50. Nope. That's not how that works. Um, so the EPA sets the standards. States have to meet or be better than those standards. Um, some laws you need to know about. The very first law that was passed for wastewater treatment was the Federal Water Pollution Control Act in 1948. And that set the stage for the one you're mostly going to be asked about, which is the Clean Water Act of 1972. <clears throat> A couple years later. The Safe Drinking Water Act of 1974 was passed. Why is that important? Why are we talking about Safe Drinking Water Act? Well, because that plays into reclaimed water and all the potable reuse uh, programs out there. Uh, uh, irrigation, there are some plants out there building direct potable reuse where they're going to be putting um, uh, treated wastewater right into distribution. That's coming down the line. So that's where the Safe Drinking Water Act comes in. Um, this is something you're mostly going to see on a higher level exam. Um, I didn't start seeing uh, title in California. Our code of regulations is title 22. Look up your state's code of regulations for what title or whatever it is that you need to know about. Um, this showed up on my grade four. I didn't see anything about drinking water until my grade four. Um, actually, for those of you who are taking your grade four California, I, some of those questions were on my T2 drinking water treatment operator exam. I was like, wait a second. Am I taking a 
you know, a drinking water test or a um, wastewater test. And that's because the filtration uh, aspect of it's important and things of that nature and some disinfection stuff. Okay. So those are a lot of the laws and permits that you need to know about. Um, this isn't just, this isn't just uh, exam stuff. Uh, right. I mean, in real time to earlier today, um, I met with some engineers and my general manager, and we are working on our um, reclaimed water permit for indirect potable reuse to the golf course right across the way uh, from our MBR unit. It's something that is in the works. Um, so you need to know this stuff for your job too. It's not just like, oh, I need to, you know, check a box on a test. It's, it's this stuff is invoked in real, real life. Um, okay. So the last thing I want to talk about, and we're going to end this episode is bio essays. Um, throughout this, this video and the video before it, um, on sampling, we talked about a lot of different sample bottles and preservatives and sample techniques and all that stuff. But there's something you should know in relation to the NPDES, and that is um, whole effluent toxicity or wet testing, W-E-T testing. Um, what we do is we use something called a bioassay um, to use a living organism to test potency of our effluent uh, or of a substance. In this case, it's our effluent. Um, it's, it's a canary in the coal mine test. If you don't know what that means, um, way back in the day when the coal miners were down in the mines, they had a canary with them, and the canary is smaller than they are and would they would die if there was lethal doses of gases that they couldn't see and that would be the signal to for the miners to get get out because uh there's there's toxic atmosphere it's kind of the same concept what we do is we take two different tests well there's a lot of different tests to wet testing i'll, I'll talk about that in a sec take acute toxicity we'll talk about that first um acute means fast right now in the moment think about uh, an injury an acute injury would be your bone sticking out of your arm <laughs> that's an acute injury Okay. Um, this is based on the subject's survival and a percent waste concentration. This is a 24 to 96 hour test typically. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go too deep in the math on this and the concentrations because that's getting into laboratory technician certifications. Uh, you don't have to dive that deep. You just need to kind of know what bioassays are. Um, so this is its survival and, and um, uh, we're just going to put it in our effluent dilution and see if it dies. That's really all it is. Um, then there's chronic toxicity. Chronic toxicity would be like um, exposure over a long period of time. A chronic illness would be like um, Lyme disease or and I'm talking about humans. Uh, um, uh, arthritis is chronic. You know, something that's repeated over and over over a long period of time. And this is based on a longer term harm to the, to the test subject. We're talking growth, reproductive, um, you know, disruption. Uh, what kind of, what, you know, what, what happens to it? And these are going to be over typically a seven to eight day test. This is a longer period of time. Do they develop any chronic issues when exposed over a long period of time to our effluent? So you have acute toxicity. Is it going to kill it? Chronic toxicity. Is it going to make it sick? I guess is a good way to say that. So both tests can be performed on vertebrates, invertebrates, and algae. So there's a lot of different test subjects. Okay. It's based off like where you're discharging and the sensitivity of that test subject to your effluent. Okay. Um, so some examples of vertebrates might be a minnow. That's a common one. There's a saltwater and a freshwater minnow they might use. There's also crustaceans. Um, there's invertebrates. Uh, we use a sea urchin for our chronic toxicity. Um, there's algaes that can be used. So um, there's a whole list and I'm not going to dive into the whole list because it really depends on where you're discharging. As an example, we use a minnow for our acute and we use a um, sea urchin for our chronic, but if you're discharging to a river, you have no need to know about a sea urchin. You know what I mean? Um, because it, it really has to do with where you're going. Um, and uh, these, these tests are part of the whole effluent toxicity testing, but it's not all of it. Wet testing, W-E-T, know that whole effluent toxicity. Um, but what I will say is it's the, it's what you need to know about. There's other stuff, TIE and like other uh, things that go into WET testing, but um, I've never seen it get anywhere further than this on exams. And I think I'm taking it even a step further. This is more good for you to know for operations, um, but you never know what they're going to ask you on an exam. So I would, I would know about acute toxicity, chronic toxicity, the definition of a bioSA, and WET, uh, whole affluent toxicity testing. Okay, that's it. We are done with this episode. Thank you for sticking around. Um, I'm so glad my voice kept up. Like I said in the last segment, I'm, I got a cold and um, half my day spent hacking up my lungs. Not that you need to know that, but here we are. Um, 
uh, if you have any questions, please put it in the comments below. If you think I missed anything, please put it in the comments below. Let's help folks out and uh, look forward to seeing you guys in the next one. Take it easy.